how do public organizations, um, how do they keep track of the huge amount of change going on all the time? How can we begin to understand, both on a theoretical and a practical level, how to work with leadership and organizing in organizations that are that much bigger than they used to be? So I had the good fortune that three of my um, collaborators, clients, uh, agreed on being a part of my, uh, of my research project. It was uh, a hospital, or rather two hospitals, that should be merged into one and move into a whole new hospital. And, and sort of the big change there was sort of a classic head doctor dominated organization to a patient flow organization. Um, and I think with only a third of the beds that the old hospital have. So patients in and patients out uh, as the head one of the head doctor. The other one was uh, in elderly care moving it what's called everyday rehab. That is the idea of that professionals should work much more with citizens, patients, to help them become active. An active part of handling their challenges, active part of cleaning, doing domestic work, all kind of work. Because sort of that paradigm comes in that the way to cure people is, has very much to do with giving people a co-responsibility and also that we know active people are healthy people. And the third one was um, institution for people with autism. And one of the big changes that's happened in doing this, this change of organization is that they were and are organized as part of the region, but the money went to the municipalities. So now from being very independent in any sense of the word, now they suddenly should be very much outward going because if they did not give the services in the quality and the time that the municipalities wanted to pay for, they had no clients. So being a part of that and following each of these three organizations for, um, for about 18 months, it was a huge privilege. And, and, and sort of what, what I'm going to think about or talk about here is sort of this coordination challenge because, and the role of leadership because in any case, new coordination challenges occur. When you have patients and maybe a third or maybe even 10% of the time, the coordination among the staff has to be really, really efficient and work very well. And uh, when you are working with everyday rehab, if not all, if just one of the staff is giving <coughs> another kind of service, then the clients get confused because they say, okay, if you come, I can get cleaned, but if you three come, I have to clean myself. What's up? So that internal coordination among the staff is extremely important. And I know in this about relational welfare, we talk a lot about uh, co-production, Samskabelse. But what I find is that it's really vital that within the organization, this co-production, this relational aspect of the welfare service is really, really vital. Because in some of the cases that we're working with right now, in some of the, the um, projects, we can see that when we, when we interview citizens, clients, patients, when they become very critical is when the professionals do not work together. When they get one professional says, well, this is, your, this is what we're going to do with it. Another professional says, we're going to do something else. So that internally uh, thing is what we do. And I think there's some huge organizational challenges that comes, goes way back to the way we organized. And that's well also my hypothesis. We're talking a lot about we organized in these columns in professional units and that's a big challenge. And of course there's this uh, idea of resistance to change. It was with me from the beginning. How do we deal with that? There must be a huge amount of resistance to change. And also a little bit about way forward. Um, one of the uh, exciting things that I learned here is that people can beat any kind of structure. Of course, it has to do the way we organize organization, but the more I work with these cases and presenting my work in, in different parts of the world, I realize that 
the way we organize organization, of course, can support and pre or prevent relationships to happen, but it cannot prevent people to work together. No matter how these organizations are, there are no patterns in the way they're organized. There is a pattern in how well can people find together across these borders. And here, of course, leaders play a vital role as the one who starts the process. So I think in, in that respect, it is really, really vital and even more vital that we get that groups of leaders as, of course, as individuals, but also as groups, work closer together. Because I remember my first job as a leader was in the military. You know, you spend some time trying to look like everyone else, and then you take two steps back, and everything do what you do, or do what you say, but they don't do what you say, they do what you do. So when you become a leader, you stand out. Everything you do and say, and don't do and don't say, is vital. And what I can see is a pattern across all these. One thing is to get different professional groups to working together. But somehow, the more senior leadership level we get at, the more independent they, we get. The longer they train in standing there on their own, having their own boundaries. And it might be difficult to get different professional groups to work together to say, hey, I need the collaboration, or what are you doing? But the more senior we get in leadership group, the bigger that culture is. So give me the picture of how leaders work together in an organization. You should not be surprised that you can same, find the same patterns among front line. And I think right here, we sort of have a double challenge in our organization because I know in Denmark anyway, a lot of these welfare challenges, the decisions are made by top managers, politicians, and then it's pushed to the front line. And when, when the front line doesn't just start to collaborating and make this happen, it's either because they're not willing this, resistant to change or anything else. I just ask those leaders to take a close look in the mirror because that's the best possible way of predicting collaboration or lack of collaboration in organizations. And that's also where I came across that idea about uh, resistance to change. It differs. What, what I found was, it actually came across, do you know who coined the term first time in literature? Ken? One of the old timers? Yeah? Where do you think it comes from? Exactly. 1947. Hardly anyone has challenged it, or rather, it's been just repeated and been studied top down. There's a few people, late 90s through the, 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 the series, to start looking at resistance to change from the follower perspective. And there they can't find it. What they can find is meaningless change. People don't understand what's expected that's not been involved. It's a three time 15 dilemma. Top management spent around 15 days discussing strategy. Middle managers are involved in discussing strategy for 15 hours. The staff listened to his 15 minutes. Who is supposed to do something? And, and it's not such, so much as I see it now uh, do we get involved in making the decision? It's simply, you cannot make sense of a process that lasted that long that you only listened to for 15 minutes. And what we do as people, we do what makes sense. We cannot do anything else. It's hard to do something radically new that doesn't make sense to us. So just the way that these organizations are organized and make decisions, it actually prevents us from doing what we call relational welfare. And again, some other organizations that are organized identically, they can do it. I think that's, that's the exciting thing is that we don't have to reorganize everything. I think one thing is that when you come and present 
or work with, with senior leaders, it takes something between five and seven minutes before someone says restructuring. And then it's funny, then it's nice to be able, and I think that's where I urge everyone that we are much wise, and I think in the community that we work within, we know the power of relationships. We know that if people can work together, we can come across everything. But still, the way decisions are made in most organizations is still based on a very traditional way of thinking. And I think that idea of resistance to change is that top manager's perspective, middle manager's, employee perspective, or even citizen perspective. If we change the way we do welfare based on professionals discussing this, you shouldn't be surprised that, that citizens, patients, families can't make sense of it. We've been used to something for a very long time.